Well, welcome to Jesus and the Gospels. This is just a snapshot of what it would be like to be in an actual physical Trinity class or in our online space during this next season. But I want to welcome you to this class. And although it's a mock lecture, we're really going to talk about this stuff. And so I want us to prepare our hearts as we would in any other time we gather together. And to start in a word of prayer as we dive deep into the scriptures, not only to learn about Jesus, but to meet him in the very pages of scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and as we draw near and close to God through the pages of Holy Scripture. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would be with us by the spirit that inspired the words of scripture to help us understand and mind the depths of their riches. Not only so that we could become professors and proclaimers of facts about you, but so that we could draw close to you to learn who you are and who we are called to be in you as sons and daughters of the living God, built up and made to exist in new life through the Holy Spirit. Be with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a segment from the course, Jesus in the Gospels, which we're actually teaching this semester at Trinity. I actually just taught this lecture last week, so it's fresh on my mind. What would begin with this prayer, as we just did, and let's just jump in uh, and have a brief lecture on the genealogies of Jesus. Now, you look at that and you might say, oh, it sounds so dry. What is a genealogy? Well, genealogy is going to be the list of the lineage of Jesus from way back, in this case, back to Abraham and Matthew. In the Gospel of Luke, it goes all the way back to Adam, up to Jesus's birth. Well, why is that important? Well, let me dive into this with you and show you. The beginning of the Gospel of Matthew starts in this way. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, this little seemingly insignificant starter verse is loaded with theology, loaded with theology. And I want to look at it in three ways. I want to look at what does it mean that Jesus is the Christ? And then I want to look at what does it mean that Jesus is called the son of David? And then I want to look at what does it mean that Jesus is called the son of Abraham? All three of these are incredibly important to Christian theology and to a theology of the person and work of Jesus Christ. So let's dive in. Well, with this term, the Christ, the meaning behind that in the original language is Messiah. This is the Greek word that translates Messiah from Hebrew. And what that means is God's anointed one. And there were many people throughout salvation history in the Old Testament who were anointed with God's Holy Spirit. And they were always anointed for a task. We see this in Saul. We see this in David. They received the anointing of God. And so when it becomes a word that is put to Jesus Christ, that is used with Jesus Christ, it's not a proper name. It's a title. It's a title. Jesus Messiah, sometimes you'll see it translated. And this is important because it's more than just saying the name of Jesus, like the name that we call Jesus, but it's talking about Jesus' vocation. What has Jesus been marked out to do? And we're going to get into that as we go further. It's not Mr. Christ. If you wanted to send Jesus mail, you wouldn't send it to Mr. Christ, 8675309 Galilee Lane. Christ was not his last name. You didn't have Mary Christ and Joseph Christ. The Christs didn't gather around the table for dinner at the Christ residence. No, Christ is a title. It means that he's the anointed one. He's anointed with a task and a vocation. That is to say, a job. And what is the job? To sum up and to bring everything that Israel was meant to be and do in his own person so that all of God's promises throughout Holy Scripture would be yes and amen in him. Jesus is called the Christ, not as a last name, but as a title for the vocation that he has to bring salvation to the world through himself as Israel. Okay, 
Here's a little quote from Hendrickson's commentary on page 108, which is a good commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. He says this, the term Christ indicates that the one to whom it refers was by the Holy Spirit anointed, hence ordained, set apart, qualified to carry out the task of saving his people. And again, that brings that idea of Jesus is the Christ because Jesus is fulfilling a role, a task, a job, a divinely set apart job. Well, we see this word, the Christ, in many Old Testament and New Testament passages. Let's look at one Old Testament passage just to give you a view of where this word occurs and how it's used. Well, it occurs in the verbal form in Isaiah 61, verse 1. Check this out. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, a me in the Greek, which means literally he's christened me, he's Christed me. And here you see it's translated in a more colloquial way, anointed me. To do what? For the task of bringing good news to the poor. And he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. You know, we see this passage from Isaiah somewhere in the New Testament. Does it sound familiar to you? Well, if you think about it, Luke 4, 18 essentially directly quotes this. And Jesus is quoting it about himself. The Lord has Christed me. He's anointed me to do something, to bring good news, to bring the gospel of the kingdom of God to the poor, to the brokenhearted, to the prisoner. Jesus is taking on that Old Testament promise upon himself. The vocation and task of Jesus is all wrapped up in what it means for him to be the Christ. You see, the Christ in the Old Testament didn't mean divine person. Oh, there's many places in the New Testament where Jesus claims his own divinity, his own equality with God. But the Christ was a word that was used of other human beings in the Old Testament and of Jesus to refer to his task. Another place it's used is in Psalm 2. Verse 2 and 7, the kings of the earth have set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, literally his Christ is what it says. I will tell you of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Psalm 2 was a popular verse in the early church to talk about Jesus as the Christ, Jesus as the anointed one. Jesus as the one set apart to bring the salvation from Israel, of Israel, to the world through his own person. And you notice here, amazingly, Christ is set up with the Son. And if you look in Exodus 4.22 in the Old Testament, it talks about the Son of God. And who does Exodus say that the Son of God is? Israel as a nation. So even that terminology of son is all wrapped up in God's chosen people, who they were meant to be, and the task that they were given to be the light to the world. And so who is Jesus? He is not Jesus instead of Israel. He is Jesus taking upon the sonship of Israel, taking upon the anointed, set-apart nature of Israel to bring salvation to the world as Israel in person. The New Testament isn't opposed to the Old Testament. The New Testament is the culmination and climax and completion of the covenant of the Old Testament. Well, that's not all. The beginning, I sound like I'm trying to sell you. That's not all. There's more. Just in this little verse, you see this language that we so often skip over. Oh, he's the son of David. Yes, yes, I've heard of David. He's in the Old Testament somewhere. Well, what is the significance of this? Well, look in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14, and you hear about this language of David's son. When your days are fulfilled, and when you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. 
He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And so what you have in Second Temple Judaism, which is the Judaism around the time of Jesus, is an expectation for one who would be this son of David, the son who will have the everlasting kingdom of David, who will take up that throne and take up that mantle and take up that promise. And who is the one who is called both the Christ and now the son of David? It is none other than Jesus of Nazareth. He is both the anointed one and the son of David, the ones whose kingdom will fulfill all the promises made to David. Now, many scholars point out that the numerical value of the consonants of David's name in Hebrew add up to the number 14. And this is significant because if you look at the structure of Matthew's genealogy in the beginning of Matthew, he structures the entire thing in groups of 14. And this is likely because he's pointing to the fact that Jesus is the one who comes in the line of David. He is the son of David. He is the Davidic Christ, the Davidic Messiah. You see, it's not just a list of Jesus' lineage. It's a theological exposition of Jesus' person, his mission, his vocation. He's the Christ. He's the son of David. Look what it says in Matthew 1.17 about this 14. Remembering that 14 is the equivalent of the consonants for David in Hebrew. So all the generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations, almost kind of jumping out at you. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. And you see to an ancient reader, especially one versed in the Jewish worldview, 14 would have signified David and what is Matthew doing in this very first sentence of the gospel? He's pointing to the identity of this one who is both son of God and son of David and son of Abraham and the anointed Christ. You don't even get out of verse one and you have a whole sermon series that you could preach. So what is the son of Abraham now? Well, we've heard of Abraham. Essentially what this does is it connects Jesus to the earliest lineage of the people of Israel. This is important because Jesus doesn't come instead of Israel. Jesus comes as the fulfillment and completion of all the purposes of Israel that God had for salvation through Israel to the world. And what this does is recall in the ancient reader, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Let's have a look at that text. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, Abraham. Has God been faithful to that promise? Well, at the time when Jesus had come, the Israelites had not come back full steam to the promised land. They were dispersed across the Roman Empire. It looked like God had not been faithful to his promise. And that's a problem. Because if God hadn't been faithful to his promise to Israel, what trust can we place in God that he will be faithful to us? Well, the answer is, and the entire New Testament talks about this, that God has been faithful to his promise to bless the world through Israel by blessing the world through Israel in person, Jesus. Jesus sums up Israel. He set apart as the son of God, who in the Old Testament was Israel. Everything that Israel was and was meant to be finds its culmination in this one person who brings all the promises of God to Israel, to the world through Jesus, who is summing up all that Israel was meant to be. God's promises are not abandoned from the old to the new. God's promises are fulfilled in Jesus, the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It doesn't get any better than this. And we're one verse in to the gospel. Imagine 
the riches that can be mined if you just get a start studying theology. This is one verse. It's almost like it would take a lifetime, an eternity, to draw deep to God, an endless well of refreshing water. And that's what college is. It's a start to a new level of depth and intimacy. And what you're doing is you're walking out ahead of other people that you will lead in order that you can bless them. Not so that you can tower over them as the authoritarian person who knows all, but so that you can run out ahead of them for a little bit in college so that you can then come back alongside of them. And who are you pointing them to? Not anything other than the person of Jesus Christ, who is the fulfillment of all God's promises. And then just to close here, uh, a great commentator, Craig Blomberg says in his Matthew commentary, Matthew's names for Jesus present him as the fulfillment of the hopes and prophecies of Israel, but also as the one who will extend God's blessings to the Gentiles. This is an amazing thing. Look, there's so much more we could talk about, and I wish we could spend an hour, but I think I'd be in a bit of trouble if I sent in an an hour-long lecture for this uh, open evening. But I want to invite you into this community, this community of learning, this community of faith, and of growth in the knowledge, not only about the Lord Jesus Christ, but a knowledge of him, a personal knowledge of him, not only as Lord and Savior, but as the everlasting God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so let me just pray as we conclude, and then we'll move into a different segment today. But thanks for spending time with me, and I hope this has encouraged your faith a bit today. God, thank you. Thank you that your promises are yes and amen through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is good news, not only to one people group, but to all people groups. Not only to the rich, but to the poor, people from every socioeconomic status and every tribe and every tongue and every culture. Help us as we draw near to you in Holy Scripture to remember that as we learn more about you, we don't become professors of you, but we become more childlike in our faith, running into the arms of a God who welcomes us by his free grace into everlasting life now and forever. We pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen.